I want to begin with a bit of an apology uh, or a confession. Last night, I, I spoke about Israel, of course, Operation Protective Edge, and I included in my remarks what I thought was an excerpt of a speech given by Prime Minister Netanyahu from the Knesset floor. But it has come to my attention that he probably did not write that speech and he probably did not deliver that speech. Like you, I have been sifting through reams of articles uh, in print and online uh, all week long. And um, this speech that apparently was never delivered was sent to me by a few very reliable, trustworthy <laughs> congregants. <laughs> and it's hard to imagine why anyone would construct such a thing. So um, I imagine it will be tracked and the, the full story will come out. But um, I guess first an apology to Netanyahu and anyone whom I may have misrepresented or misled, um, but also a warning because this is serious business and words are powerful. We know that sometimes um, people deliberately misrepresent, either with words or with images. We know that, and we need to be on the lookout for that. But then there is also, um, myself included, who innocently misrepresents. And so we should handle all of this information or misinformation with great care. This week's Torah portion opens with the middle of the story of Pinchas. If we roll back our Torah scroll to last week's Torah portion, the end of last week's Torah portion, we'll be introduced to this troubling character named Pinchas, a priestly descendant who rises up to kill another Israelite for committing unholy acts at the entrance of the tabernacle. He is a controversial figure and although he is rewarded with what God calls briti shalom, my covenant of peace, we have a very hard time reconciling this act of violence, which it seems he made unilaterally. For some, he is held up as a religious leader to be admired for his zeal, his passion for God, and his religious conviction to drive idolatry out of this world. But for most of our sages throughout history, we try to shrink the realm of possibility that such an act might ever be justified. An act of violence should be only justified in the strictest of situations and only when someone is taking up arms for the sake of peace, only then might it be justifiable. According to the pshat, the simple reading of the text, God rewards Pinchas for his actions. However, the word shalom, in that phrase, briti shalom, my covenant of peace, if we look carefully, we see that that word shalom is treated in a very special way. Treated with the scribe's quill in a very special way. We are taught that in order for a Torah scroll to be kosher, to be fit for public reading, every letter must be whole. Every letter must be unbroken. And if over time there should be found a crack in the ink on the parchment, which can happen, then that Torah scroll must be mended by a trained scribe. And the letter must be made whole once again. However, according to Rabbi Yom Tov ben Avraham Ishbili of the 13th century Spain, a scribe should treat this one instance of the word shalom uniquely. And the letter vav, the third letter of the word, should be broken. Should come not in one stroke, but in two separate strokes because this was a forced peace. This was a flawed peace. This vav is called the vav tikiah, suggesting that the sort of peace 
which came through the violence of Pinchas, was not a total peace. This is true whenever peace is forced by nations or peoples at war. This is true when peace is brought about by aggressive behavior in business or among neighbors or among family. Such a peace is still valuable and we must work for it. But it is not a total peace. This broken peace is better than the alternative but it is not a whole peace. It is a forced, incomplete peace. The irony, of course, is that the Hebrew word shalom means wholeness. It means completion. This little broken letter vav teaches that there is such a thing as incomplete wholeness. There is such a thing as imperfect peace. And sometimes this is as good as it gets in the moment. This is the peace Israel is now fighting for. This is the peace of our dreams for just this hour. But it is not what we need, ultimately. It is not enough. Total peace, the one we seek most of all, cannot be brought through violence. And so we must hold on to that fuller dream of a lasting peace for all the inhabitants of the land. This past Monday evening, some 600 people gathered at Sharei Shamayim up the street for a community-wide memorial to mourn for the three Israeli teenagers and for the one Palestinian teenager. And I shared then a poem and a word about the peace we, the hope for the peace that we long for. I'd like to share this poem with you now. It's written in Hebrew by Roni Somek, and it's translated into English by Vivian Eden. It is entitled Dream Treaties. There were half green lawns, miserly sprinklers, and one scary moment when my daughter vanished from view. She was three at the time, and after a search of several minutes, we found her grinning from ear to ear, standing in a wagon usually used for distributing towels. And the children of Samich al Qasim and Mohammed Hamsa Gehnanim had trundled her from one end of the hall to the other. More than a field of thorns could have been planted there in the furrows plowed by the adults' brows. But afterwards, the children traded roles, and the cart continued to sail like a pleasure ship in the puddles of words choked in two languages. I so wanted to be a captain, or a deck boy, or even just a life buoy on that voyage and I was madly envious of the children, who had they paper and pencil, would in the space of 10 minutes have signed dream treaties. We are still mourning for Eyal Gilad and Naftali and Mohammed too. May God watch over and protect their young souls. But I fear that we are mourning something larger still, something that is looming. And that is the loss of this greatest hope for this greatest peace that we pray will come to fulfill the Israel of our dreams. Theodor Herzl said with conviction, Im tirtzu enzo agada, if you will it, it is no dream. The leaders and visionaries who followed him, those giants on whose broad shoulders we stand against all odds, realized the dream of the establishment of a sovereign Jewish state in the land of Israel. And the next generations built up that land to see Israel thrive even beyond their wildest dreams. And yet the dream of Israel at peace, at true lasting peace, seems to elude us. 
That dream is too often replaced with either violence or cynicism at best. So the question I ask this week, one of the questions I ask this week, is how do we hold on to those glorious words of Hatikva? How do we keep them from becoming a fantasy? Or worse, how do we protect Israel's national anthem, the Jewish national anthem Hatikva, the hope, from becoming a satire? The second stanza asserts, Od lo avda tikvatenu, our hope is not lost. Hatikva bachnot al paim, the hope of two millennia. Lihiot am chovshi be'artsenu, to be a free people in our land to be free from fear, to be free from hatred, to be free from cynicism. We are so far from that dream today. We must not let the murderers of the three, nor the murderers of the one, to rob us of that hope. We must not let Hamas rob us of that hope. For we are only as worthy as our hopes, we are only as good and noble as our dreams. How do we find our way back to it? The first stanza of Hatikva offers the instruction, the challenge to us. Kol od balevav pnima. So long as still within the innermost heart, Nefesh Yehudi Homiya, a Jewish spirit, sings. Ulfate Mizrach Kadima Ainatzion Sophia. And so long as the eye looks eastward toward Zion, then our hope is not lost. And so we must ask Are our eyes locked on Jerusalem? Do our souls ring and sing with Jewish learning and Jewish living? Or is our innermost heart too easily distracted? Is our innermost heart the home of a Jewish spirit, as it was for Eyal, Gilad, and Naphtali? As we remember them, we can hold them up like a mirror. Even at their young age, they knew who they were. They were students of Torah. They were would-be soldiers of Israel. They knew where they came from. They knew to whom they belonged. Can we say the same about our own teenagers, our own children and grandchildren? Can we say the same about ourselves? Do we share their young clarity of purpose in the unfolding of Jewish history? Do we share their pursuit of a Jewish destiny? For seven days, we mourn for those boys, and we continue to grieve with their parents. But now we get up from Shiva, and we get to work. Let us create unity between Jew and Jew in Israel. That unity, that solidarity is growing. Let us create unity between Jew and Jew right here in Toronto. It is echoed, it is mirrored here when we watch the unity growing in Israel. And let us build bridges between lovers of peace everywhere, as we do today with you, our guests. And most of all, let us inspire that nefesh Yehudi, that Jewish spirit, in the coming generations. For without it, we are lost. Without it, our hopes are dashed and our dreams are deemed irrelevant. And so this little one is really our greatest celebration, the Shabbat. We cling to that hope, that dream for a total peace, even when taking up arms is justified, even when we must defend our people we never lose sight of the ultimate prayer for peace that will be lasting. O se shalom bim romav, hu ya ase shalom aleinu va'al kol Yisrael va'al kol Yoshveha. 
May the one who brings peace to the heights of heaven make peace descend on us, upon all Israel and all her inhabitants. And together we say, Amen.